Some say pricing is more of an art than a science. There have been times when I have felt that is true too. But we do have tools and guidance on information that a marketer can use to make some educated decisions about how to price a product. This presentation will cover some of those things. Why is pricing difficult? If any of you have tried to price a product, you know that there are many issues to consider. And often, you don't have all the information that could help you make a good decision. Here is a list of reasons, but it certainly is not exhaustive. The actual net price is not always clear. You've got many channels in the process that want to make a profit also. You're uncertain about your customer's sensitivity to price. What is the impact on other products in the product line? And you need to make a profit. And you may not understand the value of the product to the customer. There's always issues with international pricing where you may have to add tariffs and shipping, etc. New technologies are competing for market share. And there's a difference between management's expectation of the price and what the marketplace will bear. And price transparency. You can go out onto the internet at any time and see many prices for different products. We will attempt to discuss some of these in this presentation. One important concept of pricing is that of the price waterfall. When the marketing strategy is implemented, the actual price paid by the customer, net-net or pocket price, may have little relation to the list price or book price. You start with a list price, but then some customers who buy in volume expect and often get a reduced price. But there could be annual incentives or promotional reductions in price that bring down the actual money the company receives. And if the forecast for the product does not take into consideration these things or other reductions in price, then the forecast may not be met. And if the marketer's pay is somehow aligned to meeting forecast, this waterfall could be very important to the marketer. Businesses should be careful about missing the elements of the price waterfall that affect their price. And if these elements exist, it might be beneficial to be sure that the customers recognize some of the price benefits that may be offered, but not obvious, like free technical service or free customer service, for example. Not understanding or managing the price waterfall can have significant impact on the business. This slide describes an analysis of customers looking at the price they pay per unit versus the quantity they purchased. Some customers that fall in the upper right-hand corner are our best customers. They purchase the higher number of units. They also pay the highest price. These are obviously loyal customers, but they may also be customers at risk of going to competition or from finding out that they are paying a penalty for being the most loyal. Those customers in the lower left hand are small volume purchasers who, for a variety of reasons, are paying low prices for the product. These customers represent leaky pricing, meaning we are probably leaving money on the table here as they are most likely paying the lowest prices yet incurring the highest cost to serve based on their unit sales volumes. So marketing and sales need to be aware of what prices their customers are paying and understanding who is at risk. You need to have some objectives in mind when setting prices. Some examples are maximizing profit, maximizing sales or revenue, maximizing number of units sold, or sadly, sometimes it's just survival. We will look at each of these in a little more detail. In most cases, desire for profits results in higher prices and the firm retains more of the customer value. The profit maximizing price can be developed mathematically if both the demand and the cost curves are known. In most cases, they aren't and profit maximization is a general 
rather than mathematically rigorous objective. Profit maximization is appropriate when the segments you are trying to sell into is insensitive to the price increase. There is low competition, and what competitive products there are are highly differentiated, and customers know your brand and are very loyal to it. We call this skimming prices. Price strategies with the objective to maximize revenue usually focus on setting a price that maximizes the sales volume, usually resulting in lower prices than those of a maximized profit objective. To determine the revenue maximizing price, one only considers the demand curve. Costs are not considered. How many units at the higher price will bring in the most revenue? This often correlates to a penetration pricing strategy. Like profit maximization, this objective has its roots in economic modeling. Like profit maximization, we do not often have the data required to model the cost or demand curves exactly, so we make some judgments about the objectives of our pricing strategies. These objectives are often determined by answering the big question, why are we selling this product in the marketplace? One key point is that, in general, a maximized revenue objective results in a lower price than one intended to maximize profit. Maximizing the number of units sold often correlates to volume sales. Sometimes this is needed to maximize efficiencies in the manufacturing plant. In this case, the customers may be price sensitive and a lower price discourages competition to enter or to gain market share. Also, with typically a lower price than the other two objectives we have talked about, the company is able to absorb lower margins, at least in the short run. Hopefully this doesn't happen often, but in the overall view, it may be an appropriate short-term objective when conditions warrant. Competition is intense or demand is weak, and you are just trying to hold on until the next generation product comes to market, or there may be a glut of product in the market. During the collapse of the telecommunications market in the late 1990s, many companies were faced with a survival objective. Massive overcapacity in many areas of telecommunications equipment existed for many years, and it took quite some time to recover from that. Some companies never did recover and went out of business or were purchased by a competitor. There may be secondary pricing objectives that also will influence pricing strategies. Some of them include supporting your channel partners that provide value to your customers also. Or you need to align with other products in your product line so that you are seen as a full service provider or a change in your product, brand, or company. There are a number of methods that can be used to set prices of products. In market-based pricing, products are priced based on customer benefits relative to the competition, which is the basic concept of value. There are two approaches within this approach. Economic value pricing is a quantitative analysis which compares the total cost of ownership of one product relative to that of a competition. It's best applied when the cost of a competitive product or process can be compared directly to the new alternative. Many business-to-business -business products can be priced using this economic value pricing. The sales guidance that results from economic value pricing is sometimes known as pencil sell. Value-based pricing or customer value-based pricing or perceived value pricing is often used when it is difficult to quantify the economic benefit of a product and the customer holds perceptions about the product, quality, service, the company, the brand, reliability, etc. The economic value price might be the price of a Ford Focus versus the value-based price of a Tesla sports car. Most consumers have dealt with competitive pricing. 
Sometimes the store brand in a grocery store is side by side on the shelf with the known brand of the product. Cost-based pricing is at least, to some extent, a common pricing approach. The most common application of cost-based pricing is cost plus pricing. How much does it cost to make this product? How much profit do we want? And then you price the product on the basis of knowledge. There is a big question about how sensitive customers are to price. If we raise price 5%, will we lose some of our customers? Or if we drop our price 3%, will we pick up any more customers? Or will they buy more because we lowered the price? How much is too much? And how much of a drop in price makes a difference? The answer is, it all depends. It depends on many variables, which will we discuss in the next few slides. Price elasticity, E, is the responsiveness of customer demand to changes in the product's price. When demand is elastic, the percentage change in demand is greater than the percent change in price. Like sales increase 5%, when price is reduced by 3%. Think of the cost of medicine. If it is life-saving and there is only one drug on the market, a price increase may not make much difference. The purchasers are insensitive to the increase or inelastic. But we see changes in the price of gasoline each day, and even a penny or two price increase might drive customers to another gas station down the street that is one or two cents cheaper. People are sensitive to the price increase or elastic. The boundary between elastic demand and inelastic demand is defined to be negative 1.0. At this point, the percentage change in demand is equal to the percentage change in price. Consider a 5% decrease in price resulting in a 5% increase in demand. That's what this equation refers to. E is equal to 0.05 increase in demand divided by a negative 0.05 decrease in price, which is equal to a negative 1.0 elasticity. In essentially all cases, elasticity is bound by an upper value of zero, that is, products with elasticity greater than zero are very rare. The difficulty in calculating elasticity of demand is very difficult. More experience and time in the market with raising prices and lowering prices certainly help. What inelastic product could you imagine that would have an elasticity close to zero? If we could market the air we breathe, its elasticity may approach zero. No matter how much we decide to charge, demand would likely remain relatively constant. On a personal basis, pharmaceuticals that can save your life may approach zero elasticity. Can you imagine a situation where price elasticity is greater than zero? For some reason, there are several examples from the liquor industry. For example, several years ago, Shiner Bach beer in Texas was perceived to be a low quality beer. Shiner raised their price significantly without any major marketing or product changes, and demand went up as the beer was now perceived to be more premium. Shiner has now achieved what some might call cult status in Texas. Why should we care about price elasticity? Well, we are often confronted with price change decisions. Whether or not to lower or raise prices are questions we often face, and our decisions can seriously impact our market position. If we knew the elasticity of our products, there are some general guidelines we could apply. This is a valuable slide, color-coded to reflect the colors of a stoplight. If you know whether a product's demand is elastic or inelastic, 
it can provide some simple guidelines for consideration of potential price changes. The bad one is in red, inelastic. A price decrease will increase unit sales slightly only if E is negative and decrease revenues as well as total contribution. The good one in green, inelastic, a price increase will decrease sales slightly only if E is negative and increase revenues and will also increase total contribution. Now open to analysis are these other two. Elastic, a price decrease will increase sales and increase revenues, but total contribution may increase or decrease depending on the level of elasticity and costs. And the other one talks about elastic, a price increase will decrease unit sales and decrease revenues, but may increase total contribution depending on the level of elasticity and cost. The goodness or badness of price change decisions in an elastic market depends on the degree of elasticity and other cost factors. What characteristics cause a product to exhibit elastic or inelastic demand? The table describes some characteristics of products that result in demand being elastic or inelastic. How would you describe the class of products on the elastic side of the table? Commodity. How would you describe the class of products on the inelastic side of the table? Differentiated. Because there are greater opportunities in pricing when customers are insensitive to price or inelastic, we want to be on the differentiated side of the scale. This is a good reason that companies work so hard to create new products and features that are new, unique, or very differentiated. Finally, a table like this one can help us understand, at least qualitatively, whether our products are elastic or inelastic. Some businesses have had a discussion as to which side of the table their products fall, leading them to a qualitative understanding of price sensitivity. Obviously, knowing the price elasticity of our products is key to maximizing market share, unit sales, sales revenue and profitability, but we also know that not many businesses have actually measured price elasticity. Why is this? It's too hard to do. This slide summarizes some approaches to determining price elasticity. The quasi and controlled experimental approaches refer to market research techniques used to determine elasticity. Many companies use managerial judgment and analysis of previous sales data, which is more readily available. A discussion about pricing would not be complete without a consideration of the total product line when considering the price of a new product. The new product and its price will likely impact perceptions about existing products and vice versa. Considerations of where it fits in the product line will help with deciding its price. And in the absence of any other information, customers will determine quality levels from the price differences in the product line. So a macro look at your product line will need to be undertaken in pricing the new product. A new version of a phone may have more features and a better quality screen than the rest of the existing product line. The marketer needs to know from the market research how much the customers value those features and how much more they are willing to pay for those features versus a phone without those features. An understanding of the market, the customers, the cost of making the product and the profit needed, as well as what the customers are willing to pay for these new features and what the competition is doing is information that the marketer must have in order to price the product correctly. As we stated in the beginning of this video, creating a price for a new product is not easy, and it's not for the faint of heart.